All right. Good morning, Doug. Today we've got some more viewer questions, starting with a big one with this one of the major global events that's happening right now is this Ukraine situation. Just want to get your take on on that and how it's unfolded so far, if it surprised you at all, and how you and what are the possible ways it could go from here? Well, it should be a big nothing because just to um, just to recount, you know, the, the history of this uh, Ukraine uh, means and it's or the origin of the word was, I think, borderland. So it was a place betwixt and between where invading armies type of thing that you might expect to find in Conan the Barbarian would rampage across the plains. So it, it means borderland. And uh, I, I don't think anybody involved in this is aware of the fact that this was always viewed as a region, uh, kind of an ethnic region where people mostly spoke U Ukrainian, but uh, it, it's, um, it's not, it's never been a country in the past. <laughs> it, it was first formed as a country uh, with real borders uh, by Lenin. Uh, after the, uh, during the, the Soviet Civil War. So we're talking about, it's been around since about you know, 1920, 21, 22, 23, something in there, when it became one of the Soviet Socialist Republics. So uh, it, 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 the thing's a hodgepodge in the first place, okay? And yes, uh, there are, the Ukrainians do speak a separate language and they do have a separate culture, but interestingly, uh, Kiev has been around for well over a thousand years. Uh, mm. It's much older than Moscow. So actually the region in some way predates Russia itself. It's, it's all crazy, these borders in this part of the world. So uh, what, what, am I, what am I trying to say? Uh, the United States, has absolutely no business there at all with it. I mean, we have the U. I don't believe in nation states at all to start with. Okay, but if you want to accept nation states as things that should exist and certainly do exist, certainly no place the U.S. should stick its nose into. It, it, it's there's absolutely nothing there. In fact, the Russians don't even want it because it's a liability, not an asset. I mean, it's, it's, it's terribly, terribly corrupt. And the Ukrainians, of course, have no desire to be associated with the Russians. You've got to remember that, the, uh, that Stalin, during the 1930s, there was something called the Holomdor, which was the great starving, where, uh, where millions, millions of Ukrainian farmers, kulaks, were starved to death on their land. The Soviets came in, stole all the food, stole all the tools, and left them there to starve to death. A great way to get rid of all those people, okay? And during World War II, the uh, Germans, uh, one of the big mistakes the Germans made, of course, was, was not when they invaded Ukraine, where many, many people viewed them as, as uh, liberators, not conquerors. Uh, they should have formed um, uh, a Ukrainian Nazi army to fight against the Soviets, as opposed to doing what they did, which was looting and burning and pillaging. Well, you know, there's not there's not a history of uh, great relations between these 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 two people. No. Uh, even though you may the their, their, their language is very very similar, and so forth. So uh, I guess that's that's kind of my. What, what do you think? What do you think about the? Um, well, I do know that a lot of the the, the Ukrainians I know, uh, you know, certainly don't want to be associated with the Russian government, but they actually don't really want to be associated with the Ukrainian government much either. You know, they have a lot of difficulty dealing with them. So when I asked my Ukrainian friend about it, her response was, you know, um, we're much more worried about. The things that are that the rules that our government is rolling out for us she said the government for instance rolled out a rule that said if you were a woman 
between 18 and uh, 40 or 50 years old, 45, something like that, you had to sign up for uh, reserve service, military oh. service. Yeah. And they were, and if you, if you didn't, you'd have to pay a fine or unless you could get a medical exemption. Uh, and, you know, and, and she said, you'd have to pay a fine if you didn't do that. And then if you didn't do it, you also wouldn't be able to do a lot of other transactions. Like you, you wouldn't have the idea need in order to be able to like sell a home or rent a new flat or something like that. It's like it's, and she's like, this is a bigger problem for us than the idea of the Russia coming in. So like they're being treated worse than, than Canadians for God's sake at this point. It's, uh, I mean, it's not great. Yep. What people are not getting here is that the enemy isn't any particular government, whether it's Ukrainian or Russian or American. The enemy is the idea of the state and the government itself, that the people that get into it are the type of people that like to boss other people around. And it doesn't matter whether it's the Ukrainian government or the Russian government. But incidentally, uh, just as far as this current dust-up is concerned, these two provinces, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, which are called the Donbass, a small portion of Ukraine that appear to be about what, how can you trust any numbers? But uh, what we hear is that they're over 60% ethnic Russians and they don't wanna be part of the Ukraine. Okay, it's understandable. So uh, it ought to be, they ought to be split off. And actually Putin who, generally speaking, uh, comes out on, on the right side of these things, as far as I'm concerned, if you accept the existence of nation states to start with, is that what I thought he would do uh, was split those two things off into separate independent countries. Don't want them as part of Russia, they'd just be a liability separate independent countries that now are a buffer zone between Russia and the Ukraine, which may or may not join NATO, which ought to be abolished and which would be really stupid uh, and uh, provocative for, for, NATO, for Ukraine itself to join NATO. But it's a puppet of whoever gets, whoever pays the president the most, most money to, to start with. So, uh, Russians are doing the right thing, splitting them off into two separate countries. Now, what's the problem with that? The problem with that is that, you know, nobody in the West, uh, because Ukraine's borders are sacred, is gonna recognize either of those two countries. So they're gonna be kind of like um, semi countries, uh, but, but that's nothing new. We have one right now, nobody's ever heard about it, but it exists, it's called Transnistria. And it's part of a, or used to be part, the borders in this part of the world are so fluid and the ethnic groups are in motion. I mean, since ancient times, but even Stalin moved huge, moved millions of people from one place to another and so forth. It's a mess. But there's another semi-artificial country called Transnistria. Are you familiar with it? I, I've heard of it. I've heard of it, but I don't really know its history or any, really much about it. Well, maybe I'll get the part, of, uh, part of this wrong because I've never been to Transnistria. Mm -hmm. Nobody's been to Transnistria or for that matter, almost nobody has been to Moldova, which it used to be part of. And Moldova used to be something called uh, Bessarabia when it was part mm -hmm. of Romania. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the colors of the map on the wall are always running. And this is an example, but there are other examples uh, besides um, Transnistria, which doesn't want to be part of Moldova. I can, I can certainly understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, country called South Ossetia. There's another, right. one called, another one called Abkhazia, and a third one called Nagorno Karabakh, which has changed mm -hmm. its name to something else that I forget what its new name is. And you won't, nobody will recognize any of their flags. They're all in the South Caucasus, which is you know, Hatfield and McCoy company, country, but much more serious than Hatfield and McCoy country from that point of view. So look, this is all wag the dog stuff. Uh, you remember that movie? I, I forget, it was, was it during the Clinton era? Yeah. And it, it, it was actually bizarre because the movie talked about the Washington politicians starting a war or pretending to start a war or, or 
had something reported as a war, but it really, it was very confused, at least in my mind. Uh, and this is to, to distract attention from a domestic problem. So right. that's what this is. And, and, yeah. and the Bidenists are so stupid and so profligate, so dangerous. I mean, they could actually start a serious war o o hmm. over this, which so you, is part of our business. So I do mean, you think that... Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. I was gonna say, do you think oh. that... Um, what do you think what's happened so far is is basically did you know when when russia has moved into those russian ethnic areas of ukraine and which were already kind of at you know kind of separatist areas already from ukraine i mean they were already you know trading fire for the last several years so but him going into those areas do you think that what was the catalyst for that though because it's very confusing you know i mean it, i wonder you know is it was it provoked because of the us and nato and all that trying to push weapon systems into you know onto the border there i mean do you or, or you know i mean well, i guess i just don't understand what's the timing of this it's weird yeah let me um let me try to recall the murky history of this murky part of the world is that uh, there was a pro russian uh regime in Ukraine up until I think it was 2014. And then uh, the US fomented a color revolution there. And the pro-Putin regime was replaced by a pro-US regime. And I don't know, they've had a re had, had a uh, had a uh, an election or, or two since then, but the place is basically kind of kind of under the control of the US, that's the Ukraine. But uh, this part of the Ukraine, the, the Donbass region uh, is mostly Russian. So I think Putin's doing the right thing. Uh, rather than have a, a, a civil war on his border, he's gonna, I think what's gonna happen is he's gonna firm up the border between Ukraine and uh, Donetsk and Lugansk, kick the Ukrainian soldiers uh, out of those areas, so there won't be a war there. And there'll be an unfriendly border between those two new new countries and, and Ukraine, and then it's business as usual. Now, for the people that live in those regions, their passports won't be recognized by almost anybody, just like, just like uh, Transistria's passports are not really good anywhere. That's probably the best solution. Hmm. Well, the Ukrainian passport wasn't really great beforehand anyway. So no, no. A, 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 anyway, this whole concept of a passport and current nation states, it's, it's all going to change radically over the next 50 years. I mean, I don't think any of the countries that currently exist in Africa or certainly not in Africa or in or the, or the Middle East or Central Asia or for that matter, most of the countries in the world are going to exist in their present form. In fact, I think it's a really good open question whether either the US and Canada exist in anything very much like their present forms. The provinces will break off, parts of provinces will break off into other things. So I'm not afraid of, I'm not so afraid of one world government. I think it's only natural that uh, it's kind of like a, a new feudalism a kinder and gentler type of feudalism, hopefully, is, is going to, and it's, mm. it's happening there. So, mm. so let it Interesting. My, my so, so you think that, the, that there is a risk, though, that the, the, the Biden regime uh, kind of bungles us into a wider conflict, though, in this situation, right? That it could go, mistakes well, we made, I mean, just like World War One, you know, that's sort of, you, you, you just, <laughs> you just tripped into a giant global war, you know? That's right. Uh, a few radicals wanted to assassinate the Archduke, who, uh, by all accounts, was a, a very, you know, decent, mellow uh, guy. Uh, he wasn't an autocrat or by, by any means. He killed him and, you know, then I want satisfaction and no, I want satisfaction and we invade and then you have an alliance with somebody else. And of course, this, you know, this stupid NATO alliance, you can't tell how that's, and, and of course the US might, might really set the whole thing off because apparently you hear, who knows what the facts are, that the uh, Americans are moving thousands 
of uh, troops into Poland and the Baltics. Uh, so maybe a bunch of American soldiers get killed completely by accident. And then, you know, anything, anything could happen. Chances of, chances of Russia invading the Baltics, zero. Because there's nothing, invading countries, you know, might have made sense a hundred years ago. But now, what are you going to steal? All you're going to get is a is a guerrilla war, and this isn't like the old days when you could steal the cattle, the women, uh, enslave the men, steal the artwork. You know, basically loot the place, and then after it recovers, you can tax it and get more right. money out. So yeah, I can understand uh, conquering things was profitable and it made the ruler, the winner, feel good. But it doesn't work that way anymore. What are you going to steal? Because well, right. the nature of wealth has changed completely. Well, I know there's a lot more wealth, you know, in terms of those, there'd be a lot more to be gained by invading Russia and taking over some of their natural resources. You know, uh, there'd be a lot more for other countries to gain by invading Russia to get their natural resources than there would be for Russia, you know, to, to gain by, you know, taking over Ukraine and the Baltics. I mean, there's just no advantage there, as you were saying. No, no, no advantage at all. But even if... Even if Russia was invaded, you know, at this point, the resistance might be organized well enough that those mines and oil wells are going to be worth very little because you're going to be, you know, fighting partisans yeah. the whole time. You won't be able to make any money or anything. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. Yeah. But then it's just a further, just... further argument that governments and the nation state uh, really serve no useful purpose anymore. Right. In fact, just potentially causing huge problems. But I, what I, just, I don't know if I'm just trying to figure is this is this just is it really just a wag the dog situation where, you know, the crisis, we need something to keep people distracted from all the problems that the structural problems in all in our country and in others. Is it really just that? And, they, you know, they had COVID for a while. That's kind of dissipated. It's not going to work anymore. So they, they have, you know, Russia will be a good one for them to focus on and try and drive attention toward for a while. I mean, I saw a headline today that they were basically um, <laughs> that uh, that some spokesman for the White House was blaming inflation on the issues in Russia or in Ukraine. They were blaming high gas prices and food prices and fertilizer prices on Ukraine, like already. Oh, how incredibly stupid. I mean, look, I, I'm not a fan of any, any regime in office, uh, in, including just like I wasn't in favor of Trump, although I liked the fact that Trump was at least a cultural conservative, didn't want to overturn the, the nature of the US, which the current regime in Washington does want to do. But look, look what the Americans are, are doing. Uh, it's with the Nord Stream pipeline. You'd think that that was the pipeline going from Canada to the US, which the Biden regime canceled, okay, to get cheaper Canadian petro products down here, but no, it's between Russia and Germany. What business of the U.S. is it at all? I mean, mm -hmm. why, why does the U.S. government even have an opinion on that? Well, why, and why did the Germans say, get out of here, this is none of your business? Of course, the Russians believe that. I mean, it's- Yeah, but the Germans seem actually, to have agreed to it. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it, it's actually all quite insane. Well, people that get into politics, even if they have a slick social veneer and they smile a lot and they're glib and can talk well, they're actually uh, psychopathic criminals at heart. That's who they are. And if they weren't when they got into office, they become that. And That's here, furthermore, I'd say that of all these, of all the actors on the stage right now, I'd say that Putin is the most rational and the least dangerous of them. Hmm. I think you're right, and that's actually a shocking idea. Now, of course, everybody's gonna say you're a you know you're you're a mouthpiece for you're a mouthpiece of Russian propaganda, Doug. That's what they'll say for saying something yeah. like that. <laughs> no, exactly, and and of course, uh, Putin has his has his hands full because I've said it before. And I don't know if this is an original bon mot on my part or not, but Russia at this stage is, is really just a 
gas station with an attached gun store in the middle of a wheat field. Uh, it's, it's, it's really not a threat to anyone. Uh, yes, it still has these legacy nuclear missiles and all this type of thing, but uh, okay, that's, that's fine. In fact, Putin ought to, uh, kudos to Putin, because when the Soviet Union fell apart, they could have had gigantic civil wars and wars between the uh, Soviet republics. I mean, it could have been complete bloody chaos there, but uh, it was a, a very peaceful transition to a new and much improved world order once the Soviet mm -hmm. Union got, got, was gotten rid of. So yeah, it's not perfect and there are oligarchs that stole a lot of money and sure, Putin they say is worth a hundred billion dollars, which you know, which is fair to middling these days, but yes, yes. <laughs> okay, that's fine. But uh, listen, it could have it could have been just a, a bloody mess that turned into World War III when the Soviet Union fell apart. There could have been nuclear uh, devices all over the world. I'm sure a lot of them did escape, and we'll find out about them in the years to come. But mm -hmm. still, uh, Putin has been a, a, a net. Uh, plus, and what he's done, among other things, is they reduced the uh, income tax rate in in Russia to what is it around ten percent? Another big plus. I mean, things have improved greatly in Russia under Putin. So, uh, but you know, he's painted as the devil incarnate in the West. It's 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 the old saying by oh goodness, you'll know who this is. War is the health of the state. Yeah. Uh, who said that about the time of World War I? Oh, somebody will write it in the comments. I forget his yeah. name. Famous. Okay. Well, well, let me ask you some, maybe some other viewer questions, unless you had something else you wanted to add on Ukraine. No, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that history will, will teach everybody a lot of lessons over the weeks and months to come on Ukraine. So okay. I, I need to say more. Okay. All right. So someone says, uh, you know, you used to always say, the future will not only be better than we can imagine, but it'll be better than we can imagine. Do you still feel that way? Yes, I stole that from uh, a famous scientist who I can't remember his name. So that's not, a, that's certainly not original, but yes, I do believe that because I, I because I, I really do believe in um, the underpinnings of Ray Kurzweil's singularity where <clears throat> all kinds of uh, areas of science, uh, nanotechnology, genetic engineering, space exploration, uh, computer technology, robotics, uh, 3D printing, and many others are all advancing more or less at the rate of Moore's law. And um, Kurzweil, believes that what intergeneration or so 20 years 25 years that it'll all come together and it's going to transform the nature of life itself on this planet just right. unalterably and usually so yeah i'd like to believe that because if he's not right what, what's what's likely to happen well everybody just gets old and dies well that's no fun at least if we have a shot for the uh at least we have a shot for the singularity, you know, your possibilities open up quite a bit. Well, one of the, obviously there's a dystopian side to the whole uh, singularity idea, you know, this, uh, the, the, they refer to it as transhumanism, you know, where uh, it's kind of, you know, that basically that because control, uh, you know, because governments can control digital things so much better than they control analog things, that is, there's a migration from humans from the analog world into the digital world, or like a, a connection of the two, then this control grid that could be deployed on humans, you know, could be, you can end up like living in the literal matrix because of it. And I think that's, that's the fear. Well, is it something to be feared? I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Look, this is about the nature of reality itself. I mean, <laughs> yes. they actually be living in a matrix. I don't discount already, that. Already, yeah, we may already be there. I, I, I'm, I'm actually a solipsist, uh, which 
you know, in its, in, in its most extreme form, believes that everything is uh, a figment of your imagination. And people say, that's completely ridiculous. Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe the Chinese were right when they said, oh, what's the world rust on? And they said, the back of a turtle. Well, what's a to turtle rust on? On the back of another turtle, and it's turtles all the way down. Look, reality is, is really, really strange. And to amuse myself, uh, I spend a couple hours a week uh, mostly listening to, well, not mostly listening, but listening to trying to learn about astronomy and astrophysics and things of that nature, because it is so bizarre and so strange when you look at the rest of the universe, where we're, we're just, not, we're not even scratching the surface of how crazy and strange it is. So yeah, I believe absolutely anything is possible, including the fact that this is a, uh, a construct, uh, reality is a construct of, of, of the mind or, or everybody's mind put together. Who knows? Nobody knows. That's not to say that I don't believe in science and, and hard reality, and I do. But, uh, you know, you have to kind of let your mind wander into possibilities. And that's right. well, why, yeah. There's a lot of things that can't be, we can't be proven. We don't know, there's a lot of things we don't know that, that, that there's no. great limitations on our knowledge. Well, yeah, and, and look, at, if people actually believe in religion, uh, like, like take these Abrahamic religions, talk about, you know, I don't wanna debunk anybody's religious beliefs because that just makes you enemies. You never convince anybody. Uh, and, and, and people need something to get them through the night. It's yeah. something to hang on to and, you know, answer their kids' questions about where did Fluffy the dog go when he, when he died and things like yeah. that. Okay, religion's great for, for all that. But you, you look at the, uh, the dogmatic beliefs of especially Islam and Christianity, and they actually are in today's world insane. I mean, mm. that, uh, you know, that magic happens. That's, that's what miracles are, magic happens. That, uh, you know, Jesus was buried, he came back from the dead after three days, and then he floated upwards with the ascension, and then uh, the Holy Mother Mary had the assumption after she had the Annunciation, which is how Jesus became God. Is, there's so much stuff, and, 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 and the Muslim world, is even crazier with its beliefs, you know, that are dogma. It's in the Quran, and the Quran is the direct word of God. So look, we're, we're really a bunch of primitive chimpanzees running around this planet trying to amuse ourselves. So yeah, anything's possible. And I, I believe science fiction more than I believe almost anything, quite frankly. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. The question. Uh, we can't go off on a, a tangent. It was a good. No, question. no. It was. Yeah, it was a good question. I was asking if, the, yeah, if you still believe the future will be great. Now, uh, you you can believe that the future will be far better than we can imagine, while uh, the next ten years or so could be more difficult than we can imagine. Like you can have both of those ideas, right? <laughs> yeah, they're both they're both possible, and and you can take it further. I mean, maybe people will do something really really stupid, and we go into a new dark age. I mean. Uh, I, I promise you the Romans, they were wandering around the forum, forum in the second century, didn't believe that you know, by the fifth century, things should have gotten better. They should have gotten more powerful, but well, cattle and, and, and chickens and goats were wandering around scrounging for a living in the forum several centuries later. So they, these things happen. Okay. Uh, someone asks, say, say, I heard you say the other day that we, people like us, are anomalies in the sense that we see authority for what it is, a system that will consume all into its altar. Says, so my question is, why are we different? Is it intelligence or just a biological or, or evolutionary quirk? Love to hear your thoughts on that. Uh, are we talking about human beings? Yeah, like what is it about specifically, you know, libertarian types or types like us that basically... Oh. Whether you said we're the rounding error, you know, we're the anomalies among people. Most people don't think like us. Yeah, we're genetic mutants, I think. You know, yeah. frankly, it's uh, 
And in a way, being a libertarian is kind of a non-survival trait. I mean, can be because, <clears throat> you know, a pack of wolves, if you're a lone wolf, that's not with the pack, it's hard to survive. And that's what libertarians are. I mean, yeah. you may view it as romantic, but it <laughs> makes it tougher to survive because frankly, especially when the, when the natives get restless, and when the chimpanzees see an enemy pack, you know, if you're an outsider, you're, you're probably going to be viewed as an enemy. So I think that most societies tend to view libertarians as, as enemies to the uh, collective because we're not part of collective. We don't like the collective. I mean, we like to live in the collective, contribute to it, be peaceful, you know, but when, when, when the chimpanzees go crazy that's when the going gets tough for libertarians yeah well, what do you think is the root of it though you say when you say genetic mutation is it is it a personality trait you think it's it's not i don't think it's intelligence because i know plenty of libertarians that are you know <laughs> below average intelligence honestly so i wouldn't say it's intelligence driven no and, and and we know you know plenty of ultra status that have very very high iqs very smart yep no, it's not a question of it's not a question of intelligence. Um, it'd really be worth thinking about and exploring. But we were talking before we got on the air about horses and dogs. Now, over the years, I probably owned a hundred horses, and I've owned um, eh, in recent years ten dogs that I, that I know well, including just as we talk, one walks up to to say hello to me. Yeah, it's very nice. But, uh, and what I've found is that these animals, they can be trained and molded. And yes, that's all true. But they're basically different from birth. You take a litter of puppies and you watch them just grow up. And they are, the way they are at birth, more or less, is the way they keep evolving. Yeah. Well, like here's her sister. These two are <laughs> litter mates, and they are as different <clears throat> as can possibly be. They, they really, this one thinks that, <clears throat> she really thinks that <clears throat> she's the queen, a movie star. Everybody loves her. <laughs> of attention. But this one is, I call her the mama poodle, because she's she, totally different from her sister. They get along mm. fine. Yeah. Well, and I think the same is true of kids. Like I, I assumed when I was, when, you know, before I had children, that I, I was a big believer in uh, nurture over nature. Like I just assumed that I'd have when I had kids that I could shape them and mold them and they would be, you know, like a better version of me. And then, you know, you realize uh, what hubris that is, you know, as a parent that, you know, but my kids are the same as they were when they were six months old. I mean, they are the same. The personality is the same. My, like my son is st stubborn. He's kind of a boat rocker. He's going to do his thing. He's going to, you know, do it his way. Um, and that, that was obvious to me when he was, before he was a year old, I'm like, this kid's a boat rocker. <laughs> like he's going to, but that's okay. Cause the world needs more boat rockers was the way I explained it. And I think in the, and you know, yeah, you can, you can shape them, influence them. You can expose them to different things, but you know, they are born the way they are. And it's, uh, I don't know why, but it's, it's interesting. It's the same with dogs. It's the same with horses. Probably the same with with most animals. So uh, uh, that's why I believe libertarians are are genetic mutants because because humans are pack animals. I mean, yeah, that's why they okay. form themselves into you know political parties and countries and all this type of thing and. You know, if you're more interested in other things, you're interested in moving around atoms and the material world as opposed to moving around other people, you have a totally different philosophical orientation. And so cause for pessimism as far as I'm concerned. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it is, it is nice when you do meet another person who actually is another genetic mutant because I, I didn't meet one until I was probably 30 years old. And I, I thought, I'm like, I felt totally alone in the world. I didn't, I could never, there was nobody, I could, nobody was like me. And then now I know, I mean, everyone around me is people like me. So there are a lot of us, uh, 
not as, on a percentage basis, but there are a lot of us. Yeah. Yeah. Enough so that we can have a good time and hang out with each other. Exactly. So uh, let's see, uh, Doug, uh, does Doug legitimately worry that Canada could now enter a full totalitarian state? Well, uh, doesn't seem like it, does it? I mean, in a lot of ways, but then again, you got to look at what's happened in the past. I mean, Germany uh, was the most cultured and civilized and best educated uh, country in Europe, quite possibly. I mean, it was in the running. Uh, and what, what happened uh, after, uh, after Hitler was popularly elected? And he won by a plurality of about the same percentage of, as Trudeau, yes, Trudeau. Trudeau won by. Mm -hmm. uh, and he transformed the country. And in a couple of years, everybody was goose stepping. So could it happen in Canada? Yeah, I, I don't see why it couldn't. Well, and he did it in, this, in, the, in, in the same way, uh, in that, you know, it's, it's this invocation of emergency powers. It's, it's, and it's the same thing that Hitler did in Germany. It's, you know, it allows you to, the constitution, you know, the, the rights, individual rights to theoretically still exist. You're not like turning them over officially. You're just setting them aside for some, you know, for some contrived emergency period, which I think in Hitler's case stayed in place for 12 or 13 years until essentially they lost the war. But I think it was in 1933, I think is when he, uh, you know, entered an emergency state. So, you know, yeah, that, it's and, his... and Trudeau could certainly pick a better target uh, than than the Jews. I mean, I mean, he could pick um, the kind of people that, you know, what's he going to call the truckers? They're not all libertarians, although many of them, I think, are libertarian oriented because they don't like what, to what to do. Doug, they're they're white supremacists, obviously. Don't you know? That, that's what he called them. He called them white supremacists, homophobic, transphobic. It's, it, it's amazing that, that people actually don't call out Trudeau in public and say, what is the matter with you? Are you fucking crazy? You must be insane that you can actually say that in public and, and you're not hauled down from your platform and, and, and beaten within an inch of your life for just being so stupid. I mean, right. no relation to reality, but what happens is people listen to what they're told by authority figures, whether they're medical or they're political or whoever. And then uh, w with mass media, one girl tells another, tells another, they think that it's reality because everybody else has heard it and they all talk about it. So if they're all talking about it, it must be true. So yeah, you can get a meme started and everybody believes it because everybody else thinks that everybody else believes it. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And I can have no relationship yeah. to reality at all. What, what do you think, this uh, next question here is, what do you think about maxing out my credit cards, uh, say $150,000, screw the banks and moving to Thailand? He says, I'm an Asian American and I'm 30. I don't have much assets on paper, but uh, you know, I'm considering this option. Well, that is interesting. Uh, Let's look at the pros and the cons. The, uh, the pro is you have $150,000 of capital, okay? Con is that uh, you've defrauded the banks to get it, okay? Uh, even if you declare bankruptcy after sequestering it, it's a question of, but then again, you can go back and forth, well, wait a minute. These banks are all federally insured. Uh, is it really going to hurt the banks? And anyway, aren't these banks really just instrumentalities of the state? I mean, they're like <clears throat> part of the state in essence, if not in legality. Yeah, you can make it, but it's a slippery slope. And, uh, you know, you're going to have to explain that for the rest of your life. And uh, I, I'd advise against it. Uh, what, what do you think, Matt? I mean, yeah. where, do you, where do you draw the moral line here? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at all the angles. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't do it at all. I'm. Um, I, I think for two reasons. One, I'm just sort of. I'm against debt in general, and I know that there's a. Even I often like people say there's good debt and there's bad debt, and I definitely understand the arguments behind it. And you do the math on it, it makes sense. You know, sometimes good debt can like really, you know. It can make a huge difference, especially with, you know, like on a mortgage that's so low and it's subsidized by the government. And then when the currency is inflated, 
but I kind of have this, my, my instincts tell me that there's, there's no such thing as good debt any more than there's such a thing as bad savings. That's what my instincts tell me. So I just don't like debt on that basis. Like, I just like, I think, I think not having savings is bad, having debt or having is bad and having debt is bad. Uh, so that's my, that's my constitution, I guess, that my, my attitude about it. But, but I understand that it's going to be very, very wise to take on debt. Definitely. I understand that. Um, and, but I think that there's something about, you know, there's just something just deeply dishonest about doing that. I mean, you're basically, you are defrauding the banks and yeah, do I think the banks are disgusting institutions that basically prey on, on civilization? Yes, I do. Um, and the best way to, uh, to deal with them is to disassociate from them, not to try and uh, do what they do to them, uh, is my opinion on it. Yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're totally on the same page uh, in all ways um, on this. So I, I guess my advice, and it sounds like your advice is, yeah, I understand, uh, but, but don't do it. There's better ways to solve the problem. Yeah. And also, let's, let's say that it, it, the world might not work out the way you expect. And so in three years, when you've now taken out this this money and, you know, you might uh, and, and defrauded the banks, you might be in a situation where you could really use a little access to capital and you'll be persona non grata, essentially, at that point. So um, something to consider. Yeah, people won't, won't understand the advanced philosophical reasoning that you might use to justify this. And right. you might find here that you're not only a libertarian, but you're a pariah, which is even worse. <laughs> exactly. All right. All right, Doug. So, so they say uh, if he has about half a million dollars in a 401k and is planning to move to another country, he asks, um, you know, would you pay the early withdrawal and penalties and taxes and just take the cash out or would you keep the money invested in a 401k? Obviously, it's a personal question. It depends yeah. upon your situation, but. Well, look, tough question to answer because in Argentina, a country right across the Plate River from where we are, uh, what was it, five, ten years ago? I can't remember. That uh, the government nationalized everybody's private pension plan and made it part of the national pension plan. So you might have thought you had money, but not really. You got a promise from the government now. Could that happen in the U.S.? Yeah. Sure. National emergency. Uh, which I'm sure we're going to have, that uh, you know, for stock market melts down, a lot of people lose money. Uh, Got to you know keep people's HR tens and pension plans safe. So let's meld it into Social Security because you know you're going to get that. Right. So we're sure. safe. Yeah, it's safe. Right. <laughs> so um, yeah, it's it's worth thinking about. However, you will have to pay taxes and you will have to pay a penalty in addition for uh, for doing that it's 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 and then where are you going to put the money i mean exactly you, ha you have to have a good use for the capital to justify that big hit you're going to take on the front end yeah yeah exactly and frankly nothing is cheap anymore uh well yeah you can speculate in gold mining stocks and and, and oil oil stocks, which which I am, those are our relative bargains today. But uh, God, you know, you hate to put all your capital on, let's say uh, number twenty three on the roulette wheel, and, and hope it comes up number twenty three. Right, and you know what you can do is you can if you have if you have all this in a four hundred one k, you can actually transfer that four hundred one k into a self directed four hundred one k, where you can actually invest in some of those stocks. So you don't have to cash it out. In order to be able to take advantage of some of those speculations. Now, your most people's 401k plans don't allow many options, but mine, I can do anything I want, virtually anything I want. So it can be done. It, it can be done. Me too. The, your main danger is I is I think the question is anticipating is political. What if the government decides God knows what? And then yeah. Yep. Okay. Our let's see. Uh, hard to answer it's a, it, it's it, it, it's it's a judgment call but at a minimum they should do what you suggested and make sure it's a self-directed uh, plan it gives you a lot yep. more flexibility just in right. case yep exactly because yeah you probably are overexposed if you're if you're following this the you know it's very systematic formulate plan that they usually give you um okay so here's here's one from a canadian he says as a once proud canadian venture veteran I am now disgusted by our prime minister and veiled military threats against our people 
and now understand why all those years they kept promoting sociopaths who will do anything ahead of great leaders who ended up quitting. He's talking about people within the military. They promoted the sociopaths and the good leaders got kind of ended up quitting and just getting out of the game. He said, uh, despite being an imbecile, uh, always. Yeah. Yeah. He says, he says, despite being an imbecile, I'm still puzzled as to the ease with which the turd, I guess he's talking about uh, Castro's son here, uh, that he sold all of our gold in 2016. But in reality, to whom is truly my question? He's asking, he's, he's, well, I guess he's saying they, they sold their gold reserves in 2016, he says. And he's, he's wondering, you know, I guess who would he would have sold to? He would have sold it to in the open market, I assume. I, I presume it was sold in the open market. Uh, and there was a, a British prime minister, I think it was Gordon Brown. Uh, his name is sunk into the depths of history. And he basically sold all of Britain's remaining gold <clears throat> in about the year 2000, pretty much bottom ticking the market. So Britain sold all of its gold. I know Canada has too. I don't know if it was 2015, but it was about then, I guess. So, um, and, and who knows <clears throat> whether the US uh, actually has any gold because when you have a major asset, it should be audited once in a while. And it's true, it has nobody really knows. I mean, they don't count the stuff. And, and even if it's still there, it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Okay. Well, Let's that's see. The, answer, what's the question that, that did we answer it or, or, or? Yeah, that it was a very, it was just, I think it was more of a statement than a question. It was just, he just asked where, who, who they sold the gold to, but obviously, you know, can't know that. Um, yeah, there's, just, there's an old, look, there's, a, there's an old French saying, and as a Canadian, you'll have had some training in French, it's sauve qui peut, but he who can save himself, or every man for himself is another way of uh, uh, translating that colloquially. So uh, that's the situation we're in. Forget about what your government does or doesn't do. Just try not to be adversely affected by its stupidity. Because right. they, they all are. Governments are criminal organizations today. Right. Well, they all right. um, the, the funny thing is, it's just been so, it's like what's been great about what's happened in the last couple of years is that it really has opened a lot of people's eyes to this. And, you know, the, the cloak of legitimacy that they give themselves with their actions. I mean, you know, like, just like, you know, Trudeau declares this emergency. And then, you know, of course, then a few days later, the parliament meets and they approve it. They approve the emergency power. So now it's like you give a tyrant, if, you know, uh, it's a democratically supported tyranny. So it's fine. And, you yeah. know, even, even Putin did the same formula when he says, you know, want to go into Donbass, you know, he had the parliament first say, yes, it's good. We're fine. We, 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 we authorize you, Putin, to do it. And he's like, OK, since you say so, I'll, I'll do it. You know, and it's it's just it's all this cloak of legitimacy. It's so funny. Yeah, of course, the U.S. government specializes in that, like when when it wants to invade a country, it'll get a coalition of the willing. They'll round up some police from Dominica <laughs> and Grenada and St. Kitts to make an international operation. Exactly, yep, exactly. So, okay, uh, next question. Uh, Doug, is it looking for some of your comment or comments on gold and silver? It says, if things continue to spiral out of control, at what point will these become useful? Meaning they'll have like real utility rather than just like a store of wealth or, uh, you know, as they are now says here in Canada, I feel that the state will impose roadblocks on the use of gold and silver if things get really bad. Um, I feel not many people here have much and uh, do not recognize its value. So like, you, you wouldn't be able to go into the grocery store and buy your groceries with a, you know, a few ounces of uh, silver, right? So how does owning these things, like if things go bad, you know, these things are where we think of as a, as a safe haven, but are they, can they ever really be used in that way? Well, then the question arises, what will you buy your groceries with uh, at that point? And if things get that bad, which they may, what's the grocer going to buy the groceries from the distributor with? I mean, money is really very useful. My, my guess is that gold will become day-to-day -day money in some form in the future, just because it's logical and easy, but the state is gonna to have to be, the state itself is gonna to have to be deplatformed. In the meantime, I continue to accumulate gold coins. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Just a couple more questions here. Um, this is from an American who's living on and off in Mauritania since the beginning of the COVID hysteria. 
He says, he says, I've gotten the lay of the land here and I'm looking for to hit a home run financially. What's Doug's advice for getting rich in the, th in the third world? Joint ventures to bring in multiple big companies into the country, building a bunch of small businesses. What would be your macro strategy? Well, isn't that interesting? Because the questioner and myself are two of the very few people that are not Frenchmen in any event or that, that have been to Mauritania. I spent a week in Mauritania, actually. Uh, and my object was to try to get next to the, oh, who's the guy that runs the country? Well, I never never made it that far up the, up the ladder because I would have had to have spent more than a week there. Anyway, I looked into all this stuff. What would I do if I was in Mauritania? Hmm. Look, the problem with starting a business in any of these backward third world countries is that uh, they're not business friendly. You know, you got to bribe people and there are a lot of taxes and there are a lot of regulations and, and there are a lot of the people are uneducated. And if they are, they picked up bad habits where, you know, corruption and bribery because of the government is rampant. So my thought is that um, political entrepreneurship is, is your best bet. And uh, what would that mean? Well, in my case, it was getting to the guy on top and selling him on a plan to transform a shithole country and turn it into a, uh, a new Hong Kong on steroids. That was basically the plan. And it was a lot of fun for me and it was interesting. And in the process, I don't know. Listen, you've got to, I, I don't know what I would do in, in Mauritania. You know, one idea that I came up with there is that uh, on their local television network, that they do a knockoff of Shark Tank for smart young Mauritanians, uh, find, find some rich local Mauritanians who can act as a knock off the Shark Tank and put it on television. That'd be interesting. Mauritania doesn't have that. And it definitely needs the values promoted on Shark Tank. And it would, it would be good for everybody, for the rich guys, good for the young entrepreneurs with no money. That's an idea. Yeah, that's a good idea. Of course, I would Yeah, I mean, so I came up with that when I was there because I met some, you know, a bunch of young Mauritanians that seemed like they would be likely, you know, part of the likely market. They all liked it, but it never went anywhere. Hmm. So, um, well, the key anyway in any of these countries, as you said, as you said before, is that you have to really get close to the who's who you know, in the society. And that's the great thing about these small countries is, and as, as an outsider is that you can do that. So, you know, it is much easier to do that. And, you know, as you get closer to these guys, the opportunities will present themselves, right? But if you don't make that step, it becomes very difficult. You're always outside looking in. Exactly. What you got to do, I think, is get next to the guys that have the money and the power. Because I promise you, they are looking for people that are competent and honest and hardworking and trustworthy that they can use underneath them. So if you can bring something to the party in a way of thinking or knowledge, uh, get next to them and you know doors will open up and you'll figure things out as it goes along. But you gotta get next to the power players. I mean, yeah. in a third world country, in any country, frankly, but especially in the third world country where it's, I think it's much harder to build a business from, you know, your bootstraps and you're a foreigner. So it's much, much easier for you because- Get close to the right people. Exactly, you've got experience, you've got knowledge, you're different, you've different, you know, it's much easier for you. So, uh, but that's what you gotta do. Okay, all right, uh, just two more here, Doug. Uh, what are your thoughts on El Paraiso Verde in Paraguay? It's, a, I guess, some property development there. He says, it seems many Germans, Austrians, and Swiss citizens are moving there to avoid fascism and mandates in Europe. Yeah, I, I haven't been there, but I, I've heard about it. And it's kind of like a, um, a community for German 
speaking people, but I guess almost anybody, if they have the right to, um, I don't know, sounds like a, sounds like a great idea, but uh, who knows? I mean, things like that usually don't work out very well. Why? These places turn into Peyton Place, Little Peyton Place, which was a, a novel that talked about a, a small community where everybody is conflicted with each other and backbiting and all, all of the usual psychological aberrations that affect human beings come out when they're gathered together. And it doesn't matter if they share our values or ethnicity or whatnot. I mean, people will start acting like chimpanzees, but maybe better than the normal place. I don't know. Hey, I wish you'd go visit it and tell me what yeah. you think about it. Yeah, I'd like to hear someone's feedback if they've been there. So I looked at some stuff about it online, but you know, you really can't get a sense of it without without actually getting boots on no. the ground there. No, you know, really. one of the things we were talking about the uh, the other day at uh, our asado was you and I were this idea that expats generally share at least one thing in common, and that thing is potentially destructive. Uh, you know, it, it, it manifests as a destructive tendency. I think when you you know, and that that, that what that is is that they all have rejected the, the traditional life you know, in the, where they're, where they're coming from, they, they're rejecting, they're running away from something, not to say running away, but there, there's a rejection of it. So there's a, a feeling of discontent about what they're coming from. And in this case, it's, it's moving away. Your discontent is the, you know, avoiding fascism and mandates in Europe is exactly what this place is supposed to be around. You know, the problem with that is those are people who, as your wife pointed out the other day, is that they they generally are discontented people. And that discontentedness is almost a character trait that they then bring to this new community and they become you know, a whole bunch of discontented people trying to work together. Like, it just seems like it is a recipe for disaster. That's right. Uh, in other words, they, they have an adventurer's mentality. If that's not true, what you just said, which is true, uh, the other possibility is they have an adventurer's mentality. In other words, they, they're people like Christopher Columbus or, or Cortez or, or Pizarro or people like that, uh, which is all well and good, but you can't have more than one guy like that or a couple of them if you have a, you wind up with all, 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 um, what am I talking yeah, all about? Chiefs and, all chiefs and no Indians. All chiefs and no Indians too. Yeah. That's another possibility because they're all yeah. so interdirected and Look, it's a real problem. Hey, I guess the I guess the final answer to the question is, for whatever reason, we live on a prison planet, and just be thankful that you're a trustee and you're not down in the hole. <laughs> All right, last question, Doug. Uh, how are you playing oil? Well, it's harder now that oil is ninety, ninety-one dollars, and it's not like uh, one reason why I don't think anything is going to um, get out of control right now is because none of the commodities uh, like wheat or corn or soybeans or oil or gold or anything, none of them are going wild at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem with the commodities, and I do trade commodities every day, as a matter of fact, well, not every day, but I look at them with an idea to perhaps uh, taking on or dropping a position every day, is that, uh, Look, nothing's really cheap anymore. I mean, it was one thing when oil was 20 or 30 or 50 or 60, which is kind of like the median profitability. But now at 90, anybody that's gotten oil well is making a bundle of money. So it's not like oil is cheap. And oil is basically a political commodity. Mm. It's a question of, you know, is there a war? Is there going to be a cutoff of shipping? Is there? So none of the commodities are cheap at this point. In fact, it's interesting with soybeans at, uh, let's say, well over $16 and eight wheat at $8. These are levels now where um, uh, the natives in countries that don't have any money, uh, where they actually eat corn and and wheat and they can't afford it. You know, then they get out of the streets and start rioting. This is what happened 10 years ago 
in the Middle East, which was the last time commodities got expensive like they are today. So um, I don't know. I'm low, I happen to be long oil because I think things are gonna get serious and fall apart, but uh, it's with fear and trepidation uh, with oil at $90. Yeah. It's so profitable okay. to produce at $90. I don't know if I, I'm being, if I'm being yeah. clear. What about some of the oil? What about owning some of the uh, producers? Is that? I think uh, I do you I own think any of them. Only, only cheap stocks out there. So if you if you want to own a stock, don't own a tech stock. They've come down a lot uh, over the last six months, but I think they got a lot further to fall because it's been a, a ten year bubble. Tech, tech stocks, and right now oil stocks are being treated the way cigarette stocks were mm. uh, a generation ago. And that's when you wanted to buy them. So uh, yeah, buy buy commodity producers. Nobody the commodities may be up there uh, and, and quite high, but the stocks that that mine them, look, it's because of this ESC, ESG thing. Okay, the commodities are high because people actually need them. Okay, but the producers are are looked upon as as being criminals for raping the earth and you know, taking gold or copper or water out of her bosom, uh, taking oil away from Mother Earth. So the stocks that produce them are very cheap. And uh, uh, if you want to put money in the market, that's where I think you want to be. And, and I'd say that as somebody that recognizes that extractive industries are crap businesses because they have huge capital investments that have to be made up front and they're highly regulated and all the the locals, the natives, you know, uh, will, will attack because, you know, you're, you're violating Pachamama or some other earth goddess. And, uh, they want, they, and they want to get their, their, their royalty for it. Yeah, they want the yeah. royalty, you're easy to tax and so forth. So they're crappy businesses, but they're great speculations from time to time. And right now, because the commodities are high, but the prices of the producers are low, um, they may actually be good investments if you want to view them as investments, which you really shouldn't. But, um, what do you think so about the, where... what do you think about like, a, and I know you don't, you know your individual stocks or commodity, underlying commodities, but what do you think about like some of these uh, commodity funds or, or like the, you know, there's the, the big, the, I think it's DBC, the DB Commodity Index Tracking Fund. I don't know. Well, yeah, For... the problem with most of those things is that, <clears throat> They, uh, they hedge themselves in the futures market. And uh, so there's a lot of turnover in, in the form of commissions and bid ask spreads necessarily, because that's how they do it. They don't, you know, they, they, they don't buy like a bin of wheat and sit on the bin of wheat. <laughs> of course, it's gonna have carrying costs too. Uh, so in, in many cases with these funds, you're counting on the uh, judgment and the cleverness of the managers. I mean, mm -hmm. is that commodity trading in backwardation or contango? And should it be or should it? There's all kinds of, so it's, 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 not, a, it's not a real solution, uh, okay. those things. No, I, I forget about those, those funds. Uh, they usually dwindle in value over the time, everything being equal. So uh, buy a productive, relatively stable producer, and now is a good time to own them, I think. Okay. Just All right. Yeah. Just an opinion, not a recommendation. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll leave it there for today, Doug. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, man. Thanks.